to have you here in our Sunday worship service at Grace United Methodist Church here in Lake Bluff. I've got it on. Okay. You can't, can you not hear it? Okay. Um, we're very uh, grateful that you're here and welcome the folks watching via Zoom. We're glad you're here also. And to any guests, I think we have some guests here. Wonderful to see you and, and uh, thank you for coming. We have a fellowship time after the service downstairs. We invite you to that. Hope you'll, hopefully you'll join us. Please fill out the attendance form that's on the front page of your um, a bulletin and put that in the offering plate as it comes by. The flowers on the altar today are provided by Ann and Tom Grant in honor of family birthdays in October. Um, and we thank them for sponsoring the flowers. They look beautiful. Last Sunday was Consecration Sunday for our stewardship campaign. Um, it was wonderful. I mean, the choir sang, the bells played. It was just a great time. I had this wonderful brunch afterwards. And we all went on an adventure <laughs> outside as the fire alarm went off. So fortunately, you know, nothing uh, bad happened and everything was under control. What, <coughs> what I thought was funny, this is no reflection on our fire department here, which is very good, but we're right down the street from the fire department and we keep waiting for the fire truck to show up. And I think uh, Molly had called them and said it wasn't a big emergency, but the uh, fire department was represented by a guy who pulled up in a pickup truck. <laughs> so, but again, I think they knew it wasn't a big deal. So we all had a great adventure. Thank you, all of you who pledge, and I know some of you don't pledge. Thank you for your faithfulness uh, to this church. If you do not have a chance to submit a pledge card, you can just drop it off in the office or um, mail it in. I'd be very grateful for that. Uh, Say Grace wants to thank you for your uh, donations, of hygiene items to help families in North Chicago. Uh, and you can still bring in stuff if you forgot your stuff today, or you can make um, a donation, a financial donation. Uh, make it to Grace UMC, and then in the memo line, uh, say Grace. Uh, we had Judy Lenz's service yesterday, which I thought went very well and had a lot of people here. Uh, I think many of them former uh, students of hers when, as she taught Sunday school. And just, uh, she did, a, I think her, her oldest son, Mike, did a great job with the eulogy. And so we, it was just a, a wonderful time. Handbell Choir, Wednesday at 7. Okay, good. And the Bible study on Jonah uh, concludes this uh, Thursday at 2. You can still feel free to join us. And last week we were supposed to do the Beyond Coffee um, activity uh, during, huh? Um, so uh, we didn't get the chance to do that because the fire alarm made us late. So um, we will do that next week. And it will be, I will be good. Well, there's a little caveat. It's regular bingo. Regular bingo. But if you know your Bible, you will be rewarded. Okay. <laughs> regular bingo. If you know your Bible, you will be rewarded. So how many of you get excited when I say B4? <laughs> <laughs> If that excites you, Beyond Coffee is the place. <laughs> Bingo. Okay. Very good. All right, I believe that's it. Let us pass the peace of Christ. Peace of Christ to you. Peace of Christ. Thank you for being, what's your name? And your, is this your husband? Chris, wonderful to have you here. Great. The peace of Christ. The peace of Christ. The peace of Christ. The peace of Christ. Very good. Peace of Christ.
Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ, Lord. Peace of Christ, you guys. All right. Um, please stand as you're able for the call to worship. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, and sweeter also than honey. If you would remain standing for our opening hymn, The Church is One Foundation. We'll be singing verses 1, 4, and 5. It's page 545 in your red hymnal. Please remain standing for the opening prayer. Holy God, maker of heaven and earth, out of your great love for the world, you sent us your beloved Son, but we rejected the one whom we were to embrace. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Forgive us, renew us, restore us, so that we may be the people of your vineyard and bear good fruit for your holy realm. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today's Gospel reading is from Matthew. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, 
he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and, is, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. Today's scripture reading is from Philippians. If anyone has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew son born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of sur the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Jesus Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Jesus, want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. If I somehow, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Jesus Christ has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Ms. Unwater. Well, would our young chief come for right, We come together at this time to share our joys and concerns and to pray together. Uh, just some things I uh, wanted to mention. Um, of course, the uh, conflict in Israel and Gaza continues. The last time I heard, uh, there were, I think, like 1,400 dead, and then I saw another thing that was 5,000 dead. It's incredible what is happening over there. There's still 200 hostages, but we are all, I'm sure, very glad to see that two of them from Evanston uh, were released, and uh, they are hopefully back with uh, family. Let's continue to pray for this. I mean, it, it is such a sensitive and, you know, literally a power cave. Um, so let us pray for peace. We continue to pray for Ernie and for Nancy's brother Mark and Jim and uh, our own Mark Yandel. What joys and concerns would you like to share today? Yeah, Kathy. I wanted to give you an update on Sue Benarini in case she hasn't been around because she thought uh, knee surgery that was going to be simple on her meniscus, they found something else. So rather than being back here with us, she's going to has to be on crutches for six weeks. So she's doing fine. She has a sister in town and she has a brother around. So, um, But she definitely wants our prayers and our concern. So I'll tell her that I ask for prayers today. Thanks. I'd like prayers for my nephew, uh, Stephen, who is uh, um, working against uh, stage four prostate cancer. Oh my. And I'd also ask for prayers for our government to see if we can get it working because there's a lot of people depend on our government. Very good. Anne. I just wanted to tell you who the birthday people were that I put the flowers oh, okay. for. We have the alder flowers. Uh, for my niece's daughter, who lives in New York. For my nephew, who lives in Colorado. For my daughter, who's in Chicago. And for my sister, who's in Missouri. 
So they're all spread out. I'll take a picture and send it to them. And I'm also grateful our daughter arrived safely home from Geneva, Switzerland after a 10 hour delay, uh, layover, not delay, in Heathrow. So it's, we're very happy she's home safely. Wow. All right. Ken? My sister in law's um, father passed away on Tuesday. Uh, Walter Wojan, he was 99 years old in 10 months, so wow. she was able to be with him. Um, she's a nurse when he passed, so just um, ask for prayers for their family, okay. our family. He was just two months shy of 100, huh? Yeah. Oh, thanks to God. All right. Oh, um. Oh, there you go. I just have a joy that our dear friends Francine and Chris Hagar are visiting with us today. They are the parents of probably one of my best friends in this world, who is um, our neighbor and also teaches at Lake Forest Academy. And Chris and Francine are from Montana, and so they're making their way through. And they're good Methodists back home in Montana, so right. they love to come and join. So, welcome. Very good. Welcome. Anyone else? Okay, let's pray. From everlasting to everlasting, Lord, you are our guiding light, merciful and full of loving kindness and great compassion. So we come with our prayers as your children, sometimes lost, always loved, and never abandoned. We pray once again for the situation in Israel and Gaza. We are thankful that food and water and medical supplies are making their way in. We ask that you bless the friends and families whose lives have been taken or whose loved ones are held hostage. And of course, we are grateful that the two hostages from nearby have been released. Out of the chaos and destruction, we ask far beyond expectations, that no more blood be shed, a ceasefire may be agreed on, and peace may prevail. We lift up your church around the world, uphold believers in your strength, and grant us faithfulness to continue proclaiming the gospel. Grant us wisdom that we may discern your way and live justly and graciously among our neighbors. And we pray for Grace Church. Open our hearts and compassion as we fulfill our call to love and serve you and all of those around us. We ask that you direct people, especially those who feel lost, to this church family, a place where all are welcomed and embraced. Reveal your vision for us, and may we rest our hope in you. God of mercy and healing, who hears the cries of those in need. We pray for the sick, the injured, the vulnerable, those in pain and those haunted by anxious thoughts or having no one in their lives they can trust. May they be raised up and blessed today. And Lord, we bring you our own joys and concerns. We are thankful for the flowers on the altar today and, and the lives that they celebrate. Happy birthday to all of them. We pray for Sue as uh, she is going to have a longer recovery time and she's on crutches. Give her um, uh, patience uh, to get around on those. We thank you for Chris and Francine who are here with us today in worship. And we thank you that they're Methodists. <laughs> and we're very glad to welcome them. We pray for Stephen who has stage four cancer. Lord, it is so difficult to see loved ones go through these things, but Lord, just give them all patience and guidance, perseverance, and just uh, give them a good day when they can celebrate together. We pray for our government that seems so dysfunctional. And Lord, it seems to be getting worse and worse. Lord, we just pray that, that calmer, heads prevail, and that some common sense be brought back to our leaders. 
And Lord, we pray for Walter's family. He almost made it to 100, but we are thankful for his very long life. And just be with the family as they mourn. According to your abundant mercy, Lord, receive these prayers and accomplish your purpose for us. May we always be faithful in imitating Jesus, your Son, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We will now receive your tithes and offerings.
sing through this first. One verse so that we all hear it. Oh, we'll be able to read it. Oh, we are? Yeah. Okay. Ready? <laughs> Let us pray. God of light, illumine our hearts and minds that we might find fresh understanding in your word and imply, uh, apply those insights to our lives. Amen. I began a recent uh, message with the question, what are you doing? We talked about how the church, this body of believers in our case, <coughs> as being the primary vehicle for doing God's work. Today we begin with three questions. Where have you been? Where are you now? Where are you going? I put these questions to you because our epistle passage today from Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, read by Sandra, has a lot to do with direction the direction from which you came, the direction in which you're headed now, and determining the direction you want to take in the future. And most importantly, Paul talks about what should fuel that choice, the motivation that lies behind it, the goal we are to embrace, and the necessary things that must happen in order to launch into that new path. Where has Paul been? He begins by pulling out his resume. He's it's quite impressive. We get the feeling right away that Paul is an overachiever, a type A personality to the extreme. And it is astounding what he accomplished in developing the church in the Greco-Roman world around the Mediterranean Sea. I, 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 it's just unbelievable how much he did basically on his own. He says that if anyone can boast in outward accomplishments, it is he, circumcised on the eighth day required by the Jewish law, not only a Jew by birth, but also a member of the prestigious tribe of Benjamin, into which King David and Jesus were also born. 
He is a Pharisee, the sect of Jews that were strict, meticulous observers of the Mosaic law and its 613 commandments. How would you like to keep 613 commandments in your head all the time? We have a tough enough time with 10, right? These no-nonsense men, no women, took their religion very seriously. Paul's righteousness under the law, that is, his status in being right with God, well, he's blameless. In addition to adhering to the law, Paul also, also actively defended Judaism. He notes that his zeal led him to persecute Christians who the Pharisees saw as heretics. If you recall, Paul was on his way to persecute Christians in Damascus when Christ intervened and stopped him in his tracks. That is where Paul has come from. Where is Paul now? Well, despite this stellar career, Paul counts all of it as loss in light of what Jesus means to him. In fact, nothing in his illustrious past means anything to him anymore compared to the surpassing value, he says, of knowing Christ. Paul has lost everything that ever meant anything to him in order to follow Jesus. His reputation as an exemplary Pharisee has been blackened, and now he has no credibility in the Jewish world, which is his only world. And Jesus' followers did not believe that his conversion was legitimate. In addition, he has suffered great physical pain in telling others about Christ. Attacked by the Jews as a kind of heretic, he formally tried to eliminate He's assaulted by Gentiles in the cities where he preaches, by the Romans, because he was a troublemaker. The Romans did not tolerate unrest. He was whipped. He was stoned, not in the fashion you're thinking of, literally pummeled with rocks. I was hit once in the face with somebody who threw a fastball at me. I can't. That pain was unbelievable. I can't imagine someone throwing heavy rocks at you. A lot of people doing that. In Philippi, in fact, Paul and his fellow evangelist Silas passed a slave girl who was possessed by a demon. Her owner was making money off of her because she could predict the future through an evil spirit. Paul cast the demon out. And everyone was very thankful, right? <coughs> no. The girl's owner could no longer make money off of her, so she, he complained to the local authorities. Paul was impeding commerce, and that's something you just don't do. He and Silas were publicly stripped of their clothing and beaten with rods. Paul was imprisoned at least three times and is actually writing this letter to the Philippians from prison. Yet he uses the word joy and rejoice <coughs> excuse me, 16 times in this very short letter, celebrating despite his circumstances. How in the world can he do that? Well, joy, like love, transcends circumstances because it is the fruit of the Spirit's work in our lives. And of course, <coughs> that joy springs from Paul's relationship with Christ. Paul no longer thinks of himself as right with God because of the laws he keeps. His righteousness now comes through trust in Christ, the righteousness from God given freely to Paul and all of us based on faith. He understands that his efforts in working for God's acceptance can get him nowhere. He can only be reconciled to God by realizing he can do nothing to make that happen himself. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's tough for a type A personality because they are all about getting things done, striving to complete the task at hand with their smarts and their effort. What do you do to make things right? Well, in Christianity, you can't do anything on your own to be reconciled to God. We know where Paul has been. 
We know where he is as he writes the letter to the Philippians. Where is Paul going? He says he wants to be as much like Jesus as possible so that he can know him even better. He wants to be like him, that is to imitate him. My nephew Keith studied classical guitar at Peabody Conservatory in Baltimore. He told me how he once attended a master class taught by the classical um, guitar virtuoso, Manuel Baruch Eco. I think that's right. His student seated, seated behind him played a certain piece. Keith said it was good, but he seemed to exert a lot of energy. He was nervous. His fingers did not move smoothly. He was kind of stiff. There were a lot of rough edges. The master kindly commented on his student's performance and suggested ways to improve his playing and clarify his interpretation. Then the master played the piece. The student and everyone else watched in awe as the guitar sang beautifully, movingly. Fingers flowed so gracefully without any effort at all. The piece was seamless. In comparison to his student, it was as if he were playing a different instrument, a different piece altogether. The student seemed frustrated as if to say, how can I ever play like that? But the master led him step by step through several passages, and by the end, the student played the piece much better than the first time around. Imitation. The student improved by watching someone who was a master of the art do what he was trying to do. And then he imitated that. Now the goal is not for the student to exactly copy what the master uh, did as an end in itself. It is to advance in your own technique, in your own ability, in your own understanding, but more so to move beyond where the, mas the master went to create your own style of playing music. Paul is imitating Jesus, and we find out he wants the Philippians to imitate him because he has developed a relationship with Jesus and is far ahead of them in his own spiritual journey. We find Paul saying, I'm the example, you are in the... I, I'm, I'm the example you can see in the flesh now to follow. The disciple or student has learned from the master. Now the disciple can lead other students. And isn't that the Christian mission after all? At the end of the Gospel of Matthew we find, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Making disciples. Making students of the master making imitators of Christ. We're not talking about cookie-cutter imitation. Just as the master guitarist with his student, Jesus seeks to bring out our individual gifts and attributes. But Paul wants to go even farther. Big surprise. He is willing to share in Christ's sufferings, even share in his death because that suffering and death is nothing compared to the promise of resurrection, eternal life with Christ in Jesus' very presence. Paul said he has not achieved this goal, but he presses on to make that state of intimacy his own, he says, because Jesus Christ has made me his own. The word there can be translated seized. He is seizing Christ as Christ seized him. Paul is imitating the one who has already accepted him and who continues to thoroughly embrace him. Why imitation? As one commentator states, knowing Christ is not some kind of intellectual exercise. Rather, it is to live in relationship with him in such a way that one comes to know him intimately. To know him intimately. And to know him is to be conformed 
to his likeness. We read what Paul writes, and we can only say that type A personality, my goodness, he seems to be so obsessive, maniacal, out of whack, all that sacrifice. We could never leave everything behind and actually desire to follow Jesus to the point of sharing in his sufferings and death? Maybe not. But we can all know Christ. We all know, really know, certain people who are close to us, a spouse, a family member, a friend. We know what they're going to say in certain circumstances. We know when they're down. We know when to shut up around them. We know their strengths, their weaknesses, their fears. We know when they need to be cut some slack. We know wonderful things about them that no one else does. But we cannot know wonderful things about someone after one encounter. We can only have that knowledge through constant contact through care and concern, by paying attention, by sharing ourselves with that person, by giving of ourselves, by committing ourselves to that relationship. Through that same process, we come to know Christ. Paul says, there are two things necessary to know Christ. Forgetting what lies behind and stretching forward to what lies ahead, he says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of a heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. We can all make more room in our lives for Jesus by forgetting what lies behind. But what does that mean? Well, maybe it's an overly critical parent we just can't get out of our head, an abusive or unfaithful spouse, a boss who kept you from advancing in your career. I have found in several cases when the bad things that have happened to someone rule and consume their lives, they find it difficult to know anything else. Now, I'm not saying you just forget those things and pretend they never happened. I am saying that we need to stop letting them overwhelm us and start chipping away at them. We may have to leave behind positive experiences, too. Paul had become a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was the model. It would have been easy for him to just sit on his reputation and cruise right into retirement. I suppose Pharisees retired at some point on what he had accomplished in the past. But there is a new calling, and he cannot ignore that. And in order to answer that call, he has to abandon what was in the past. Paul is starting from scratch, forgetting what lies behind. All of those accomplishments, it's as if they never happened. We can all make more room for Jesus in our lives, secondly, by stretching forward to what lies ahead. The language used here are metaphors used in sports. In a competitive race, the runner must not only not look back, but he or she must also stretch forward to ensure that he, re that he reaches his goal. The picture is that of a runner who does just that in order to finish the race as quickly as possible. Now, metaphors have their limitations. No, Christianity is not a competitive race although you might find some people who think that's the case. Instead, stretching forward may be better rendered as, in another version as straining forward, which refers to disciplining yourself to have total focus, as a runner does, on the prize ahead and nothing else. Probably very few athletes won anything wondering in the middle of a race or game whether or not they pay the electric bill wondering what clothes they were going to wear the next day. No, they were focused on the task at hand. What are you doing to forget what lies behind and strain forward to know Christ more closely? John Wesley talks about 
certain actions being the means of God's grace, those things through which the Holy Spirit works to bring us closer to God. One of those practices is prayer, of course. Another is what Wesley called searching the scriptures, reading the Bible regularly and reflecting on what you read. Another key means of grace is worship and communion, participating in the life of the church. Another is good works, helping and assisting others in need. That one has done a great deal here at Grace. We are all thankful for that. Where have you been? Where are you now? Where are you going? Forget what lies behind, strain forward to what lies ahead, press on toward the prize. Rational knowledge of Christ, sorry, relational knowledge of Christ here and the promise that one day we will see him face to face. Amen. Our closing hymn is My Hope is Built. We'll be singing verses 1, 3, and 4, page 368 in your red hymnals. Please stand as you're able. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward, pressing on to what lies ahead. Imitate Christ in all you do and continue on your journey in knowing him better day by day. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen.